Thanks. <clears throat> It still feels a little weird to say this, but my life now, because of my work, exists within two realities. Now, I actually think that every single person in this room, in the not so distant future, will at least spend a little bit of your time in the other reality as well. It's a digital landscape that we call virtual reality. Now, no, I'm not just talking about gamers or tech enthusiasts. No, not at all they're actually already in there. They're already on top of this. I'm talking about everyone else. This is where we start looking at how virtual reality adapts to the work environment and other aspects of our everyday life. The IDC predicts that there'll be, there will be a compound annual growth rate of 198%, totaling $143 billion in 2020 just for the virtual reality industry. Now, that is the most statistical, boring way that I can say VR is getting to be a really big deal. We need to pay attention. Because if the IDC is correct, and all arrows point that it is, then by 2020, virtual reality industry will be $50 billion bigger than the global video game market. So it's not going to get there on video games. HTC, Facebook, Google, Samsung, Sony, Microsoft, any other PC manufacturer you can think of, and a couple of independents, didn't just sink in a ton of money over the last couple of years so you can play a new video game. That would be completely crazy. This is about your life. This is not just about work even. This is about every aspect of what we do. Think of it like the birth of the internet. How many people would cut off their right arm just to go back in time and invest in a little piece of where the web would be going at the birth of the internet? Right? That's where we are today. If you could go back in time with the knowledge that the internet was going to connect every piece of our lives, not just, inter not just entertainment, not just video games, not just chat rooms, but work and business, cat pictures, recipes, uh, political gossip. Would you not go back in time and do that? Well, that's where we are right now in this very moment with virtual reality. It is going to change our lives. It will completely, Im not, impact isn't even the right word, it will completely turn the tables of how industry and work is done. And it's going to change how we look at our world. Not only will it change how we look at our world, but it'll also change how we look at each other. Very few people actually develop for virtual reality, but our numbers are growing. I happen to be one of them. I have a great team who develops fantastic virtual reality. In doing so, we have to start asking ourselves a lot of different questions. See, in this world, the one you're currently sitting in, there are a lot of limitations. We don't even think about it, right? Um, we don't think about these limitations because they're just part of life. It's like gravity, right? That's a limitation. But that only happens until someone says, you know what, I bet if we do this, we don't have to do that anymore, right? That's what technology does. Technology improves some aspect of your life. And there's this unspoken rule that the user has to conform to a new set of restraints in order to get the benefits of that technology. Think about driving a car or flying a plane. Now, both of those are wildly unnatural actions to the human experience. That is, until it becomes part of our everyday life. And then it becomes second nature to breathing. Virtual reality is, as far as I can tell, the only technology that actually breaks this pattern of taking the user and forcing them into a new set of rules. Instead, the difference is virtual reality says, we're going to take this very unnatural technology and convince you that it is your natural state of being. 
So we have to approach designing this technology from a completely different perspective. My hope is by giving you a couple of examples, telling you a few stories, some of the successes and the pitfalls, you'll be better prepared to become pioneers in this industry as well. Envision your life, your work, whatever it is, in a whole new way. One where the only limitation is that it's digital. Think about that for a second. What would you change? For me, when I'm asked this question, it goes back to uh, your work, your businesses. That's what I do. It's really about how we connect with each other, even if it's about business, right? And this is where VR goes to business. It's about the connection that we have. Now, I remember one of the first things we built in virtual reality. This was actually pretty interesting. It was a really large steel machine. VR is great for pre-visualizing large things that you can't get into a room. And we had this designer come in to pre-visualize this machine that he designed, and he was six foot tall. This machine operated from the about right here, about mid-level, all the way up to the top. It was, a, it was a tall machine. It went from bottom up, meaning that when you started using the machine, you started here, and then when you were done, all your controls were up at the top. Okay, well, this makes sense. The designer got into the headset and loved what he saw. It was almost instantaneous approval. This was great. Now, this was before we sent it off to be manufactured. This didn't actually exist in the real world. And so he was super happy with what was there. His wife was with him, and she wanted to try it because it's virtual reality, right? Like, who wouldn't? It doesn't matter how boring it is. It's VR. Of course, you want to try it. And so she got into the headset. Now, she was considerably shorter than he was. And you can probably already guess where the story was going. She started the experience, and everything was fine, but she couldn't complete it because all of the tasks were too far out of her reach. We pre visualize in virtual reality for this very reason. And it goes through the entire business process. You can already see how we're saving millions of dollars in design and manufacturing. That didn't go to manufacturing before we fixed that problem. That was something that was ready to go. But it doesn't stop there. It then goes into sales and marketing. We're now sending these tiny little headsets instead of these large, massive, demoable units to trade shows and sales conferences. And then it goes all the way to the customer. That's right, they're taking virtual reality before they get the product and training their employees how to use these machines. They're seeing increased retention of the information, a lot more comprehension, and they're able to go through safety guidelines before anyone's in danger. Now, remember, all of this happens before the machine actually exists in the real world. But there's a, another problem. This is about everyone. And as much as we'd like to think all people were created equal, and I believe that they are. Their realities are not. We are not experiencing the same reality. We are all perceived realities going across each other. Let's reconsider the, the tall designer. Now remember, he was happy with what he saw and almost sent it. It wasn't until his wife saw it and said there was a problem did we stop it from going to manufacturing. Now, the error wasn't necessarily in the design or in the software. The error was that the designer brought his perceived reality into virtual reality. It's hard for a tall person to step away from that constant and relate with what it's like to be a shorter person. It's been a constant for so many years, that's just not an easy leap to take. But we can do this in virtual reality. What we did was we set up a system that lets us just change the user's height. It was quite magical. You could now experience the machine that we were designing at multiple heights of a range of different people. Now, in the real world, that's almost impossible. But in virtual reality, it was just adding a few simple lines of code. I'd like to tell you that height is really the only problem. Believe me, it's not, and we've learned this the hard way. Perceived realities that are genetic-based are something we can kind of predict, but it's the learned realities that will get you. Learned realities are way more nuanced, uh, but I find them to be really interesting. When we first started designing virtual reality for a trade show, I thought, okay, here's what the controller looks like. 
I'm going to have the controller that's in the real world look like the controller they see in the virtual world. To me, I thought that this would like, make a connection between the real world and the virtual world, a familiar, a familiar link. And for the age range of 35 and under, it was fine. They would take the controller, they'd point it at the object, they'd walk over to it, they'd touch the object and pick it up. This is inside of virtual reality. 35 to 45, it's kind of a coin toss what they would do. 50 and up almost entirely had the same problem. If the object was here and this was their controller, they'd put on the headset, they'd push the button, and then into the ether they'd go, it's broken. Nothing would happen. And I'd see what happened and I'd say, oh no, you need to go up to the object. Try again. Uh, still broken. No, you actually have to go touch the object. They would go as close as humanly possible to that three-dimensional object without touching it. But they'd never touch it and it would never work. Why was this happening? This was annoying. It was constant. It happened over and over and over again. Well, 35 and under saw the controller as an extension of their virtual selves. It was their virtual hand and you have to actually touch the object to pick it up. But 50 and up saw it as a remote control, similar to the TVs that they grew up watching. Now, it actually kind of looks like a TV remote, and it, that makes sense, because you take a remote, you point it at a screen, it manipulates something when you push the button. They weren't wrong. It was our failure to recognize their world expectations. So what was our solution? I kind of felt dumb after we figured this one out. You take the virtual reality controller and you make it a virtual reality hand. The hand is a constant between all humans. We know how the hand works. And we also know that you have, to, you have to touch an object to interact with it if it's a hand. It almost instantaneously solved the problem. It was that simple. Now, yes, I'm sure at least a handful of people are in this room going, you're just spouting off common sense things about how people interact with the world. Precisely, yes, you're right, now think about that. That's the problem. For the last 40 years, we've developed software to live on a flat screen and be controlled with a keyboard and a mouse. Productivity tools, business tools, will not translate well into VR if we continue with this pattern. It doesn't work. In a way, we need to go back to a time where we approach the user where they're at. Think about the people who thought the remote was a remote control and not a hand. That wasn't their fault. But it took me putting myself in their shoes to figure out why that was happening. It's a weird form of technological empathy in a way. We have to think about how people interact with their environment. Sometimes to do that, you have to go back to go forward. If anyone knows me, you know I have a very unhealthy obsession with the Atari 2600 video game console created in 1977. Now, this video game console, it wasn't the most powerful, it wasn't the first to market, and it didn't have the best looking games. In fact, it failed on all of those aspects. So why did it end up in the majority of households in the early 80s? Its success was that it was accessible to everyone. If I had a gripe with VR today, it's this. These are the controllers for the Oculus Rift, a great VR headset and a fantastic headset for the VR gamer. But take a look at it. That is a lot to get used to if VR is your first experience. And especially when you're talking about going into life simulations, into work simulations, into where these things are going to be introduced to people for the first time, we, can't con we cannot continue to assume that people are already familiar with video game controls. It'll likely cripple the adoption rate if we continue down this path. So again, what was our solution? Remember the Atari approach slide. We actually take this to heart. I believe what made the Atari 2600 video game console so popular was this. 
It was simplistic to use. A joystick in one red button. It was iconic. When I say Atari, you think of that. You don't think about the console, you think of that. Because that's what you held. And it didn't matter if you were a child, if you were a teenager, or if you were a grandparent. Anyone could pick up an Atari controller and have a video arcade in their living room. And this is the approach that we take. We take these really complex controllers in our business and we disable all of the buttons. We go down to one button, the most accessible button, and that's all we use. And believe me, it makes our job very difficult. But it makes the approach to the new user very simple. And that's the key, embracing simplicity. Universal accessibility is just the holy grail for adoption rate in vir virtual reality. But it really should be the goal for any technology that is created to, cre to connect people. Remember, we're all individuals. We do share some of the same similarities, some of the same parts of our reality, like gravity, but we're not actually truly identical. When we take a virtual reality simulation and duplicate it perfectly, how we interact in it will still be unique. If you're gonna leave an impact in this business, if you're going to bring VR into your industry, remember three things. One, remove constraints. Think about your reality, what would you change? Take it out, because we can now. But then when we do that, consider who's gonna use it. Have that technological empathy. Where are they? Meet them where they are at. And that's probably gonna lead you to an uncomfortable decision to embrace simplicity. Keep this basic. We can celebrate basic because that's where we are right now. Eventually we'll demand more controls, more usability, but until that happens, this is where we're at. A new reality came when very few people were looking. It's not enough to think outside of reality, we have to think outside of the box and into virtual reality. If you're gonna be a pioneer, be a pioneer. Take these lessons and I hope that it helps you create for your own business, your own work. It's our unique opportunity to actually write every programmer's first line of code which for me was ironically, hello world. Thank you. <laughs>